Hello everyone. I'll be talking to you today about abdominal x-rays or abdominal radiographs if you prefer. Here's a general outline of what I'll be covering. I'll start with their indications, followed by typical views. Then I'll discuss normal anatomy as seen on x-ray, and I'll end by reviewing 15 to 20 common abnormalities which any clinician should feel comfortable identifying. I will not be discussing the general physics principles of radiographs as they're covered in my first video on my chest x-ray series. A link to that is in this video's description. As a lead in to the indications, I'll first point out that chest films get a 10 episode series on strong medicine, while abdominal films only get this one video. The reason for that, abdominal films have a much more limited role in 21st century medicine. Some people joke that in the era of easy to obtain abdominal CT and point of care ultrasound, there's almost no reason to even order an abdominal film anymore. But while they are much less common than they were a generation ago, they still have some role today. First, they are useful for the emergent evaluation of bowel gas, as in suspected small bowel obstruction, or for the emergent evaluation of pneumoperitoneum that is, air inside the peritoneal cavity, usually from a bowel perforation, if CT is not immediately available. Abdominal x-rays are useful in the assessment of radio-opaque foreign bodies, that is, the ingestion or insertion of objects. They are also helpful with the assessment of the positioning of lines and tubes and other medical devices. There are a few other uncommon indications, but these are the main ones. Some internists and internal medicine residents will use them to assess stool burden in patients with severe constipation, but I'm not personally convinced that that's an appropriate use of the test. When considering the relative value of ordering an abdominal x-ray, you should keep in mind that the radiation it delivers is at least 10 times that received during a PA chest x-ray, so it's not negligible for younger patients, though it's still far less than the amount of radiation delivered during a CT scan of the abdomen and pelvis. Now, let's talk views. There are three main ones. The first is by far the most common, the supine AP view. AP meaning that the x-ray beam travels from the anterior side of the patient to the posterior side. This view is useful for identifying most pathology, that is, in situations where abdominal x-rays are useful at all. The term supine AP view is often used interchangeably with the acronym KUB, which stands for kidneys, ureters, and bladder. I've heard some radiologists object to using these terms as true synonyms, but to a non-radiologist, this difference is semantics, provided that an accurate indication for the test is placed in the x-ray order. That way, the radiology technologist can shoot the proper film regardless of what you call it. Another view is the upright abdominal view. What's shown here is technically an upright PA view, in which the x-ray beam travels from the posterior to the anterior of the patient, though this view can also be taken with the patient facing forward, in which case it could technically be referred to as an upright AP view. But unlike with chest films, in which there is a significant difference between the AP and PA views, there is not with upright abdominal films. This view is best specifically for identifying small bowel obstructions, which is really its only major indication. And then there is the upright chest view, which as shown is also a PA view. You might wonder why a chest view is included in a discussion of abdominal radiography. It's because an upright chest is the best view for identifying pneumoperitoneum, often referred to as free air under the diaphragm. This just shows up better on an upright chest film because of a better view of the diaphragms as compared to an upright abdominal film. A chest film will also help to assess for intrathoracic conditions, which could lead to referred pain to the abdomen, such as a lower lobe pneumonia. For patients who are unable to stand, a left lateral decubitus film, in which a patient is lying down on their left side, is the preferred view to identify pneumoperitoneum. You will rarely hear someone mention an abdominal x-ray series or the so-called abdominal three view or abdominal three way. This is a largely obsolete series consisting of the three views we just focused on, the supine abdominal view, an upright abdominal view, and a PA chest view. Alternatively, for patients who cannot stand, 
the upright abdominal and PA chest are replaced with a left lateral decubitus film, plus or minus an AP chest view. It's honestly been years since I've had a patient receive this specific collection of films, as there are few indications in which all these views would be indicated in the same patient, and CT and point-of-care ultrasound are now used in such situations. Next, we'll talk about normal anatomy on an abdominal film. To understand normal anatomy, you need to keep in mind that one of the major limitations of x-rays is that they don't distinguish between structures of similar densities, and there are only five basic densities seen. Black means gas, dark gray is fat, light gray is soft tissue or fluid, white is bone and other calcifications, and intense white is metal. So an organ like the kidney or spleen, which is soft tissue surrounded by soft tissue and fat, can be difficult to discern, and more generally, abdominal films are very poor for identifying pathology of all solid organs, including the kidneys, spleen, liver, pancreas, and reproductive organs. Abdominal films are best for looking at bowel gas patterns, which is where most people start their interpretation, excluding a very brief assessment of technical quality and confirmation of the view. Differentiating small and large bowel is not always possible, but there are a few clues one can use. First, the small bowel tends to be centrally located, while the large bowel is on the periphery. The small bowel's mucosal folds, known as valvulae conaventes, or Kirkring folds, are relatively thin and span the width of the bowel, while the mucosal folds in the large bowel are called haustra, which are relatively thick and usually do not span the width of the bowel. The upper limit of normal for the diameter of small bowel is 3 cm. For the large bowel, it's 6 cm for most of the colon, but 9 cm for the cecum. Some references also list 9 cm as the upper limit for the sigmoid colon as well. Overall, this is known as the 369 rule. This film is not a normal abdominal film, but rather shows toxic megacolon in a 10 year old with inflammatory bowel disease but it is a particularly good example of the central versus peripheral bowel distribution. One of the most challenging things about the interpretation of abdominal films is that the range of normal is subjectively much wider than it is for chest films, and therefore it takes viewing many more abdominal films than chest films to feel comfortable in distinguishing normal from abnormal. Next, let's look at the normal anatomy of solid organs on abdominal x-ray. As mentioned earlier, the solid organs are all poorly visible on plain radiographs. In this case, we can identify the location of the liver. The kidneys are a little more subtle, but a normal spleen and pancreas will not typically be visible on plain films. Then there are musculoskeletal structures. Obviously, these include the ribs. This is the lowest one, the posterior 12th rib, the vertebrae, the sacrum, the ilium, the largest of the three pelvic bones. There is not a distinguishable demarcation between the ilium and the pubis and ischium in adults as the three pelvic bones normally become fused. Abdominal films will usually catch the head of the femur as it articulates with the acetabulum. And finally, there is a triangular shaped shadow on either side of the vertebral column, which is caused by the psoas muscle. And in extreme brief, since upright chest films are occasionally ordered for the evaluation of abdominal symptoms and intra-abdominal pathology, we of course have the heart and great vessels in the middle, with the right and left lung and the respective hemidiaphragms on either side. There is a link to a complete discussion of chest x-ray anatomy in the video description. For the remainder of the video, I'll run through some common abnormalities identifiable on x-ray. Here is probably the most classic abdominal x-ray finding, at least in adults. If not apparent from the supine film, the upright film may give it away. This is a mechanical small bowel obstruction, or SBO, caused by a physical anatomic obstruction to the movement of intraluminal contents forward through the bowel. The most common etiology in adults is something called adhesions, which in short are bands of scar tissue usually caused by prior abdominal surgeries. The main feature of an SBO on x-ray is multiple centrally located dilated loops of bowel with multiple air fluid levels on the upright view. Although not directly related to the diagnosis, these films also show nice examples of valvulae conaventes, the small bowel mucosal folds which span the entire width of the bowel. 
This other upright film may not be as immediately obvious an example of an SBO, but it is a good example of something called the string of pearls sign, in which a chain of small air bubbles are caught between mucosal folds within an otherwise fluid-filled bowel loop. Each one looks round instead of having miniature versions of classic air fluid levels due to the effect of water's surface tension at that smaller scale. Here's a supine film in a patient with something called an ileus, which in common usage is used synonymously with a dynamic ileus, in which there is an absence of normal peristalsis leading to bowel distension. Distinguishing an ileus from a mechanical SBO on plain films can be difficult, if not impossible. Often the clinical context may be necessary to distinguish them in that a mechanical SBO is usually the reason a patient presents to the hospital, whereas for an ileus, that's usually something that develops after the patient has already been admitted for something else. Here's another classic x-ray diagnosis. This is a sigmoid volvulus. This is when the sigmoid colon, normally located in the lower left quadrant, rotates around itself, choking off its blood supply like kinking a garden hose. It is an imminently life-threatening diagnosis requiring emergent endoscopic or surgical management, with the endoscopic option only appropriate for patients presenting before the development of peritonitis or perforation. Radiographic findings include a massively dilated colon. Halstra within the affected segment are usually absent. And this bowel gas pattern is sometimes referred to as the coffee bean sign. Volvulus can also involve the cecum, which is normally located in the right lower quadrant. Cecal volvulus also results in a massively dilated colon, but haustra are usually present as indicated, and there is a lack of colon seen in the right lower quadrant. And now showing the two forms side by side for a comparison, because they do look a little similar. Sigmoid volvulus is the more common form. Here is another classic and much more benign finding. This is a patient with constipation. We see soft tissue-like opacities with internal mottled air within the large bowel. That is all feces. Here is a finding called thumb printing, in which thumb-shaped indentations in the bowel wall are caused by edema of haustra related to infection and or inflammation. Regarding its potential etiologies, it is most classically associated with inflammatory bowel disease, but can also be seen in infectious colitis, such as C. diff, diverticulitis, and ischemic colitis. I'm going to move from abnormalities of intraluminal gas to those of extraluminal gas, and there are two main ones to worry about. The first is best seen on an upright chest film, which we already discussed a little earlier. Specifically, we can see free air collecting immediately under the diaphragm indicating the presence of pneumoperitoneum. The list of potential etiologies of pneumoperitoneum is very long, but the main considerations include peptic ulcer disease, bowel ischemia from any cause, appendicitis, colitis, perforation of a diverticulum in the setting of diverticulitis, penetrating abdominal wall trauma such as a stab or gunshot wound, the ingestion of a foreign body resulting in bowel perforation, and as a complication from endoscopy. Last. Pneumoperitoneum can be observed after either laparoscopic or open abdominal surgery. In this circumstance, air usually remains visible for two to three days on average, with almost all post-surgical patients having resolution of the air within seven days. As mentioned, while discussing the x-ray views, in patients unable to stand upright, pneumoperitoneum can be evaluated with a left lateral decubitus film, where the gas will collect between the intra-abdominal contents and the abdominal wall. The other significant extraluminal gas abnormality is more subtle. It's called pneumatosis intestinalis and is air within the bowel wall itself. It can affect either the large or small bowel. There are many etiologies, which include intestinal ischemia and infarction, peptic ulcer disease, inflammatory bowel disease, C. diff colitis. It's been observed to occur in asthma and COPD. Any form of a significant immunocompromise, including steroid use, chemotherapy, and AIDS, mechanical ventilation, and once again as a complication from endoscopy. The next major category of abnormalities is calcifications, the first of which is nephrolithiasis, more commonly known as kidney stones. The majority of kidney stones contain calcium, and so are radio opaque on x ray. They can be present in the renal pelvis, ureter, 
bladder, or urethra. Here's an example of one probably in the proximal ureter. And here's an example of what's called a staghorn calculus, which is a very large stone that occupies some or all of the renal pelvis. Gallstones are another finding sometimes seen on x-ray, although only a minority are visible. Gallstones can be present in the gallbladder, as they are here, as well as the cystic duct, common bile duct, or they can be visible as they pass through the bowel. And here is an example of pancreatic calcifications. This finding, particularly when diffuse, as in this image, is most classically associated with chronic pancreatitis, such as that caused by chronic heavy alcohol use. But focal and or smaller calcifications can also be seen in cystic fibrosis, in pancreatic cancer, and even rarely as a finding only related to advanced age, in which case they are referred to as senile calcifications. The final category of abnormalities are foreign bodies. Here's an example of a hip prosthesis, likely in an older patient who had severe osteoarthritis. You can see a variety of hardware related to spinal surgery. This is a fusion within the lumbar spine. This finding is a little more subtle at first glance because it's lined up in front of the vertebral column, but that fine net-like structure is an endovascular repair of an aortic aneurysm. This elongated foreign body might be puzzling until you realize that it's within the ureter. This is a ureteral stent, also called a double J or JJ stent. It's coiled at both ends to prevent migration with the upper coil within the renal pelvis and the lower coil within the bladder. This next one is actually a pelvic x-ray rather than an abdominal x-ray, but both can show this, an intrauterine device or IUD, which is inserted into the uterus as a means of contraception. This here is the correct location in which it is oriented as an upright T in the midline and just inferior to the pelvic rim. While IUDs can be malpositioned within the uterus, which can be seen on x-ray, they can also perforate the uterus and migrate to various places within the abdomen and pelvis. And finally, we have pathologic foreign bodies. Pathologic foreign bodies can get into the abdomen and pelvis either by ingestion, rectal insertion, from penetrating abdominal trauma, or from something being accidentally left behind during a surgery, such as surgical sponges shown here, which should be made to be radiopaque for this exact reason. One of the most common and important foreign bodies to see on x-ray is the small, uniform, flat, circular opacity, which only looks like an ellipse here because it's usually seen from an angle. While many of these are coins, which are generally benign and will usually pass through the bowels and be expelled with feces without difficulty, some are actually button batteries, which can cause internal chemical burns leading to perforation, peritonitis, and death. It's been estimated that about half of deaths from button battery ingestion occur due to someone misidentifying the battery on x-ray as a coin. In addition to button batteries generally being smaller than coins, they will also usually have a double ring visible, but the absence of such a visible ring does not rule out the possibility of it being a battery. Films of any flat, circular, ingested items should be carefully reviewed with a radiologist. That concludes this introduction and overview of abdominal x-rays. If you found it helpful, please remember to like and share it, and consider checking out Strong Medicine's accompanying video series on an approach to chest x-rays.